yeah, the recording is live now. Your Excellency, okay. take it away. All right, then. Um, my name is Mistress Maimuna bin Daoud Asikalia. Um, and the Sicilia is uh, Sicilian, indicates that I'm Sicilian. I'm obviously dressed like um, a Norman today uh, in honor of the class. Um, I usually uh, dress Islamic. Um, the reason that I was interested in doing this class was the fact that my friend um, Giada asked me um, personally to do something for her, is that my persona is based on Palermo uh, during the time of Roger II. And I have taught classes on Roger II before, but I felt like I hadn't done the groundwork uh, behind uh, the, the preamble to how Roger II ended up being in the position that he was um, in the Mediterranean. And so I started to re researching this class um, and I find it really interesting and complex. Um, I'm going to be romping through almost a hundred years from 1016 to 1101. So I'm not going to, I'm gonna talk, there'll be a, like a 10 minute section where I kind of go through the century, but I'm gonna talk more generally about sweeping tendencies um, and whatnot to get you a feel for what happened rather than to go into endless details of which Pope attacked which Norman and et cetera, because it's back and forth uh, through that whole time. Um, and I'm kind of interested in why you were interested in the class. I, um, I gave a class about the Norman conquest maybe 15 years ago at Kensick and um, the chivalry showed up thinking that I was going to talk about troop movements at Civitate. And that would be a really, really cool class, but I will never be the person who gives that class. So if you came here for that, I hope I do not disappoint you, but I'm not doing that. Does anybody want to comment on, on what they, maybe you have a Sicilian persona or whatever? Um, personally, my persona is Northern Italian. However, my um, mundane ancestry is a mix of Sicilian and Neapolitan. So understanding a lot of the heritage on that side is particularly fascinating, especially because at least on the Sicilian side, it is a major uh, melting pot. So yeah. any kind of history I can find is awesome. Okay, anybody else? Well, I'm interested in the Islamic world in general. And while I know this is not an Islamic period per se, this is part of the mixture that makes up the complexity of Sicily. Yeah, so I will touch on that in this one. Um, when I get the Roger the second one out, there's a lot more um, uh, because he ran his household. He had an Islamic administration of his household, um, his chamber. So um, there's a lot more of that um, in the second class. So. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not ignoring Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so one of the first things I have on the file section for this, there is a handout. I did not write um, a book in there because it's already been done uh, quite a few. There's a lot of resources for this time period. Um, I did try to do things that might be helpful to you if you want to go deeper in this. Um, I have contact information for me um, in case you need it later. Uh, and there is a rundown of important dates that I'm going to skip through at a later part of the class. There's a bibliography. Um, historians, uh, there, were, there were quite a few period historians uh, writing about this at the time. Um, so we have um, two notable ones were Anna Comnino, who was the daughter of the Byzantine emperor. And she wrote about uh, the invasion by the Normans uh, of Byzantine lands, which I'll get to later. And William of Apulia was um, an unknown person uh, who was a monk, I believe. And he was assigned to follow Robert Use card around and record what happened. Um, so 
then in there, and I, I'm going to switch to screen share um, and show you my really amateur and funny filled in with coloring pencil map of Italy, which I did so that I would not be stealing anyone else's map. Um, let me see. There we go. So Google Drive. Uh, okay. Oh, did you? Um, did well, I thought I had it up on my own computer, but that's not working. Anyway, um, I can go through this if you can download the file or if you can see it. Um, and you feel like you need to while we're doing this, that's an option or stop me or whatever. Um, I wanna give you an idea of what the major political high level factions, what was going on in Italy at the time that the Normans showed up. So the starting place. Um, and- A pardon me, Excellency? Uh, do yeah. You have, um, do you happen to have a way that we could get the, um, get the handout or like the PowerPoint or whatever, a link to it in the chat so we can download it if if the screen share is not working or? In the Google Drive for this, um, for the teachers, I uploaded it yesterday. Okay, in that case, I'll put a link in the chat for everyone then. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I had um, trouble screen sharing the last time I taught a class a couple weeks ago. So yeah, it sometimes messes up. Well, I don't want to spend the whole class trying to fix uh, my lack of understanding of Zoom. So I'm going to try and, and go ahead anyway. Um, the Byzantine Empire had controlled uh, large portions of um, Italy uh, after the fall of Rome. Uh, another wave that came in was the Lombards, who basically were Germanic tribes uh, who took in most of the northern Italy and had had um, city-states throughout parts of central and southern Italy, but they had been beaten back by both the Byzantines and the Holy Roman Emperor. So you have the Holy Roman Emperor to the north uh, with some vassal states. Tuscany was a very large semi-independent vassal state of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and Spoleto um, and Salerno were also semi-independent vassal states, but more of uh, the Byzantines. Uh, the papal states in the center and on the west coast uh, were all around Rome and then across the north into Romagna, which is the cur current district of, of Italy. Benevento uh, was held for by, it was like the Pope's summer retreat or whatever. And that was contested back and forth, but mostly that was papal. Um, Palermo, um, let me go into Sicily. The first attempt at conquest of Sicily by the uh, Islamics was in 652. It failed. Um, we don't, it'll very similar reasons for why the Normans had trouble with it. Uh, in 828, they had they conquered Syracuse. In 831, they had conquered Palermo and they had complete control by 901. There were various factions from the North Africa. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the dynasties because probably it's out of your, we, we don't need to know that for this class. Sicily in general was controlled through history, through to the end of the SCA period by a long list of uh, peoples and, and empires, including the Phoenicians, Greeks, Carthaginians, Romans, Goths, Byzantines, Arabs, Normans, Spanish, and French. And that's just within period. So there was a lot going on right that, about that, but at that time, it was completely under the control of um, Islamic uh, caliphs, although they were not all the same one, there was a lot of internal conflict going on. So. That's uh, the background. Any questions so far? Really high level. Okay. 
The second question is who were the Normans? Uh, the Normans were Norwegian. They were Vikings. Uh, and they entered into France at around Rouen and went into the Seine, uh, the Seine River, um, and basically conquered that by boat around from the northwest in towards Paris um, along that river. Uh, they were granted land uh, around 910, uh, and which eventually developed into the Duchy of Normandy. Uh, they were, as we believe them to be in the SCA, pretty right on. They were all, they, they had the Destrier war horse. They had the kite-shaped shield. They developed helmets, the cone-shaped helmets, and, uh, and eventually the nose guard. They wore fairly he heavy armor for their weight. Um, in the 45 to 50 pound range. Um, they used a straight sword, a shortened uh, version of the Viking great sword. Um, they favored cavalry tactics. One of the bizarre things that happened is that they came in on ships in a seagoing culture and then forgot about ships and became focused on the cavalry. By the time they got to Italy, Someone else was manning the ships. They didn't own the ships. They bought transport. And what they did was based around cavalry. Um, they, their, the expense of a knight's outfitting was such that if a man did not receive a um, hereditary land grant, it was very hard for him to get his gear and to support himself as his men as men of arms. They basically overproduced uh, humans in this little culture. And they left because they were hungry. Um, it's as simple. They did not leave uh, Normandy planning to conquer Italy or William the Conqueror had a pur purpose, but in general, they left to get a job. Um, in, in the simplest sense. So why did they come there? The historians are still a bit um, uncertain on this because the historians that wrote about it contradict each other somewhat. And it's such a nice, pretty little story that, that it's unlikely to be completely true. But basically, they, there was a group of Normans who had gone on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, who stopped in Bari, which is on the east coast uh, in the southern part of, uh, it, it's in Apulia, uh, stopped there because that was a pilgrimage site. And a man named Milos, who was a Lombard, uh, met with them and asked them to bring back soldiers to help Lombards mount um, an opposition to both the Byzantines and to the Holy Roman Emperor to gain back independent states. Uh, because at that point, all the Lombard states were uh, under vassalage um, in one way or the other. And he was afraid of them dying out. So they said, well, we'll have to go home and get people. And they came back in about a year. That's, that's the story. Let me go back to my timeline. So the supposed meeting in Bari was 1016 and the arrival of 40 Norman Knights was 1017. Um, there were two major families that ended up being significant um, to history. One, and I don't know how to pronounce this. I could not find anybody that anywhere on the internet that pronounced it. So I'm just gonna take a wild stab at it. Drengo, D-R-E-N-G-O-T, it could be Drengot, I don't know. Um, that family came with the first wave of 40, uh, and most of them came at that time, because they, one of them had, uh, had murdered a member of the, uh, 
posse of the um, Duke of Normandy, of his uh, hangers on, and they were exiled. So all of the men of arms in that family came to um, Italy with the first wave. Uh, the oldest one of those um, led the Battle of Cani, which was the last big chance of the Lombards to gain independence, and they failed. Um, although the Normans at that point impressed everyone, and they had good work from that point on. So Normans, because of the results of that battle, were in demand as mercenaries. Uh, so a, a slow, continuous uh, transfer over uh, of the Normans began at that point. Uh, Reynolf, which was who was not the eldest, um, but he was the first to receive a land grant. So this that was 1030. So approximately 15 years in, they have gone from being homeless mercenaries to um, being petty nobility and having a permanence in Italy. Um, in 1035, the de Hauteville family, the first members of the de Hauteville family show up. So if you can get, or just so you know that it's there, um, part of my handout, I gave up trying to get software to do this. And I just made an Excel spreadsheet and then I took um, a, a Sharpie and made the generational lines. So I did um, I did a genealogical chart for the de Hauteville's, for the Drengott family, and for one of the Lombard families that married in with both of these, and for the ancestry of the first wife of Robert Cuscard. So the amazing thing about Tancred the Hauteville is his ability to produce children. Um, he was just a minor lord, not anybody big in, in Normandy, but his first wife um, produced five males that lived and a bunch of daughters. And his second wife was even more prolific. And um, I have, eliminated from the genealogy people who, well, most of the women and people who did not go to Normandy uh, because it would just be too much. We're, we're talking like 16 children of uh, girl Tancred. Um, so the first sons of Tancred were William brought a fair, which is Iron Arm, Drogo and Humphrey. They arrived in 1035. Uh, in 1041, the oldest Hauteville led a battle again at Canaan, which was successful, but at that point he was fighting uh, four local dukes against the Byzantine. So that got him a, du a duchy of his own. So now we have one of the Normans is Duke of Apulia. So they begin to grow like this um, 1046, Robert de Hauteville, uh, who will become Robert de Guiscard, and Richard Drincoat arrive. Um, they're big players all the way in, and I'm going to focus on um, Robert uh, as typical and important and one of the most um, interesting characters to talk about. Um, Yeah, I'm not going to read through this because, I mean, uh, you realize that in this time that, let me back up. So back in Carolingian times, the decision was made that the Holy Roman Emperor would be involved in selecting the Pope, that the Pope had to concentrate, concentrate the Holy Roman Emperor and the Holy Roman Emperor had to consecrate the Pope. And during this time of the Normans, the papacy had gotten extremely corrupt and bishops 
and any kind of holding or position in the church that would involve money or often bought or hereditary, even though they weren't supposed to have children, they did. Um, and a lot of the, the wars here and the conflict during this time period is the church trying to have a reform movement that brings the power for these ecclesiastical matters back to the Pope when the Pope does not have an army. Um, and when, when his land uh, holdings are repeatedly reduced. So that's a big part of how the Normans moved up the ladder was by getting involved on every single possible side of the conflict between the Byzantines, um, the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, do I mean Dren Drengat? I said Drengat. I'm not sure what you're asking. No, it's the person ahead of me asked. Oh, so I okay. was just answering. Yes, that's the one I need. Um, Thank you. Okay. So, to put it short, within about 30 years, they had gone from mercenaries to being dukes. They then continued to move from various ways to be among the most powerful people in Europe and the Mediterranean at that time. Um, how did that happen? So part of the reason is that they were very, very practical people. That they did, they did not let things like loyalty or <laughs> moral integrity bother them. They, they came in, it might be the easiest way to think of them is as a cartel. They came in as individual thieves and they literally did brigandage. They were robber barons, uh, but they had um, a few characteristics which made them better than the other robber barons around. And, and believe, it, the more you get into this, the more, the more horrible you realize that um, life was at that time. The Byzantines were really good at torture, I'm just saying. Anyway, so Robert Guiscard, he, Guiscard means uh, cunning in old French. Um, he had, he came in as a younger son of the de Hauteville family. Um, he's on the second wife side. And the first smart thing he did was to marry well. So he married a woman who was in Italy, whose family was in Italy, but whose lineage goes back to Normandy and Flanders, whose father was willing to give as a dowry 200 knights. So suddenly by this marriage, he went from being um, someone who was reporting to his own uncle to a man in his own right. So that was the first thing that he did. Um, the, the other thing that they that Guiscard did, and the Normans in general, is that they learned and adapted extremely quickly. The whole dynamic that I've talked about with the you know various powers that be in that area were not known to them in Normandy, and within a very few years they were picking up um, the politics and new skills they needed in a different geography. Normandy is extremely flat the Normans made extremely good use of the mountainous regions and the geographical um, advantages that you can get from differences in height, from narrow passes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they were religious, they were nominally Christian, um, but they would just as soon burn and, and uh, pillage a church as go to it for worship especially at first, uh, in, the, in the first 40 years or so. They were also not particularly nice to the people that they ruled. They didn't really care about ruling. They would basically burn earth 
the, the places around them where a new new knight was trying to make a name would be so overtaxed by supporting their ambition that the common people would revolt. There were constant revolts against uh, Robert Wiesgard. Uh Every other year, he would go do something in Sicily. He would get called back to put down a, a revolt. They also revolted against each other within their own families. There was a certain amount of um, loyalty to family. They worked together often, they favored each other. But if it really came down to who was going to be the richest guy around, they were not afraid to cut the other one out. Um, also, Robert Guiscard decided after three or four, I think it was eight years, something like that, after he had married Alvarada and gotten the, four, the 200 knights, um, he decided that it would be more advantageous to him to marry uh, the, wife, the daughter of a Lombard since he needed to get along with them in to order to control his new holdings in Calabria. So fortunately, the Pope had made a ruling on consanguinity and he made up, found documentation that said that his first wife was too closely related to him and he, did, he set her aside. She doesn't seem to have been too upset about it. I'm not sure that he would have been a really great husband, but she had a son, Bohemond, who he made illegitimate. And you may know that word from not learning about crusader kingdoms. His anger at being cut out of the inheritance of Guiz Card continued all the way to the first crusade in 1096. Uh, so most of his young life, he was trying to get back his inheritance from his half-brother. Um, Guiscard married a woman called Sicklegata, uh, who was apparently frightening to a lot of people. Uh, she was larger than normal, um, although most of these people were very small. Um, but she also fought in armor. She led troops. She, by herself at one point during a revolt, Guiscard went off to to another town that was under attack and he left her at their capital under siege and she managed and re, uh, defeated a siege, an eight month siege by herself. Uh, she was often seen at the head of battle in armor and it was one of her habits to take her horse behind and ridicule soldiers who had run away and say, look, there's a woman up here on the front line, what, what's wrong with you? So. Um, interesting people. Um, but Giscard also had kind of a, a soft spot. Uh, he really didn't like the torture and the retribution. There would be a revolt and he would take their lands away, uh, send them to a monastery, etc. He did, he did not uh, have people executed or blinded generally, which was very common uh, in some of the other stories. Um, but he would forgive them, which was a problem for him because they would then revolt, they would get followers again, and four years later, he'd be fighting them. Uh, so he was a complex and interesting person. Um, he is the one who uh, mounted an attack on um, Byzantine, Byzantium. Uh, at one point, the emperor of Byzantine decided that Guiscard was powerful enough that he wanted one of his daughters to marry Wiscard. And he wanted the alliance partly because of uh, problems with the Byzantines being run, wanted to get back into Sicily at that time, and partly because of defense of the Holy Land from Seljuk Turks and other um, complications. So he offered his son to marry Wiscard's daughter, and she went as a child and stayed there um, waiting for them both to mature. And she became baptized in the Eastern Rite. And they renamed her Helena. And then as Byzantine emperors were wont to do, he was assassinated and the new emperor bypassed his son. Um, and she was just um, put into a convent. And, and so Guiscard used that 
there's no real indication that he had tried to get her back in any way. I think he got mad at them about something else and, and decided to invade them. And uh, he did fairly well. Uh, in, in fact, I've jumped ahead of myself, but at one point, because of his attempts on Sicily, because Italy is so much a giant coast and he had control of both Apulia and Calabria at one point, um, he decided to try to build a navy. And his first attempts at building a navy uh, were failed pretty miserably. He was on his way to Sicily to try and conquer Palermo, which he, they tried like three times before they succeeded. Um, and the Pisans uh, who controlled and were almost pirates along that part of the coast came down and, and basically wiped out his first navy. Uh, his second navy got to Palermo and the Saracens wiped him out. Uh, and, but he learned. They changed the way they designed the ships to be more like the Sicilian ships, were, which were this Islamic style that was more maneuverable in battle. Um, and he kept going, he just didn't give up. The man lived with his armor on from the time he became an adult until a couple of weeks before he died in his, his 50s. He was on the road of contact, uh, conquest the whole time. Uh, he was usually running two or three major campaigns at the same time, fending off the, a revolt, helping the Pope, going after another city in Sicily. Um, so he decided to take his new fleet to Byzantium and try to get up close to uh, Byzantium while also having troops conquer their way across land um, to get there. And the Venetians at that time were vassals of Byz Byzantium and they were concerned with the power that the Normans were getting in Italy and jealous of their own dominance in trade and they just wiped his navy out. It was uh, humiliating. But that didn't stop him. He said, okay, I've always been better at a cavalier. It's just a, a chivalry, but we'll just get more people over here and we'll, we'll keep going. And within six months, he had gotten all of Illyrium, which is basically Albania and something else in that area, and was marching on in that direction when the Pope called him back because the whole Roman emperor was trying to take Rome. But anyway, so the other guy that I want to talk about um, that's important to the story is his younger brother, Roger. Um, Roger came late, let's see. Where's Roger? I think it's in the 50s somewhere. Anyway. Um, Roger came and was impoverished. He was very young. Um, he went to work for his brother, Robert, who was doing well off. And he did, Robert made him in charge of um, some garrisons in um, Northern Apulia. And he did so well in the things that he was assigned and was so well respected by people in his council that Robert became rather worried about him. I mean, and, and he should have been because Normans were like that. So uh, he actually tried to starve him out and Roger ended up going to work for, for another one of his brothers, I think William, um, and did a little bit better and then Guispard pulled it back in. So finally, when Guispar decided he was going to Sicily, I think that one of the reasons that Roger was a good choice, besides the fact that he was very good at what he did, was that it would put Roger far away from Guispar's other holdings. Um, and he sent Roger to Sicily, their first successes, successful, um, they had several unsuccessful besides the naval approach on Palermo, but they finally got Messina, which is just off the 
toe of the boot uh, and established a uh, garrison there. Um, and so at, at that point, Wiscard went back home and he left Roger there. Um, and Roger had very few, he had a hundred or less knights uh, to keep a garrison and to try to keep moving forward while the Saracens were trying to get him off the island. So he found he had to take a very different approach. Rod, Robert started with his 200 knights. Roger had to use diplomacy and wits. And he decided that with still Byzantine encampments in Sicily, uh, the culture was very embedded there. There were a lot of Eastern churches and monasteries, um, the Saracens and native Italians in the area that the best thing for him to do would be to pull the people that he conquered into rule and to make sure that they were happy with uh, being vassals. So he copied to a certain extent the philosophy of the Islamic leaders called Dhimmi, D-H-I-M-M-I, -M -M -I, which says that um, people who also follow Abrahamic religions are a protected class. And even though they are vassals and they are taxed, they are given home rule and their culture and their um, religion are honored. So Rod, Roger started investing in Eastern churches and monasteries to make them feel comfortable, which was significant because this was right after like two years after the Great Schism, when the Pope and the Patriarch had excommunicated each other. So they were nervous about their existence. Some of them were trying to move back to Greece. Um, and so he made them feel welcome there. Um, so every town that he captured one by one, he would then allow them to, if it was an Islamic, Town, they were allowed to keep um, their Sharia law um, and manage their own affairs. Uh, so he also, one of the things he did was play the various caliphs against each other. So his first major victory was um, to go, one, one man came to him and said, um, I would like you to get rid of my enemy and I will be your vassal if you will leave my city alone. So they worked together and that worked and he started expanding. But the actual full um, pacification of Sicily um, and reconquest of Sicily took 60 to 80 years, depending on what you want to think is the end time of it. But out of the realm of this. Um, Roger and Robert jointly held parts of Calabria and Sicily um, at the end of this time period and uh, had nominal control over all of Sicily at that, at that point, 19, uh, 1090, um, 1101. How am I doing on time? Ah, I got 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so let's talk about, so, so we contrast Robert um, as, as being impulsive, not a leader, a, a conqueror, not a leader. And Roger starts emerging as a leader. However, one of the problems at the end of this period is succession for both of them. Um, Robert died um, in 1085, and he had the succession problem at Bolomund. Um, and Sikulgeta had a son who was uh, actually fairly young, um, Roger Borsa. But Sigilgata managed the regency. 
thing and managed the diplomacy and backed Roger Borsa and um, Roger the first of Sicily threw in behind Roger Borsa. So that allowed some stability in Apulia and, and Calabria. <clears throat> um, Roger, on the other hand, Roger's first wife was his true love from Normandy. And, and that's, a, that's a fairly solid story. Her family moved to Italy after he was already there um, and, and really after he was in Sicily. Uh, and when he found out that she was available, he immediately tried to marry her. Um, he had one illegitimate pop child, Jordan, who later plays roles in history and in the um, uh, Crusader kingdoms. That name will come up. And a bunch of girls, lots of girls. Um, he had a second wife, Judith died. Second wife, Aaron Berga. And she, she also died. Um, she had a son who did not much figure in history and a bunch of girls. And then his last wife, he was actually 58, I believe when he married this girl and she was 14. And by the time she was 16, she'd had a child. When he died, she was 22 and had two, two boys. And she went through controlling successfully two regencies. Her first son died. Second son, um, Roger II, uh, succeeded his older son and lived through his regency to become um, the Duke of Sicily and later the King of Sicily. He was briefly declared emperor, but you know, that's between him and some false pope, I'm not sure. Anyway, so that is the setup for Roger's kingdom and the second part of this dynasty. This dynasty goes through from Roger, descendants of Roger through uh, four other generations. Um, and is another 130 years worth of history. And I do, as I said, intend to do that class. So contact me if you want to know. Um, so, and one of the things that's way too complicated to go into, but I will take it as a broad stroke. When they first started coming, the Normans in general first started coming to Italy, they married people in Normandy. Then they began moving up in rank and they intermarried all across any important family in Europe at that time. In Roger II's lifetime, Eleanor of Aquitaine in her old age actually had a hobby of intermarrying important people and some of his children were placed according to her. So this family of Tancred de Hauteville ends up being part of almost every major royal line at some point in Europe. Um, and the de Hauteville still exist in Normandy. They have a very nice garden, um, which you can visit. Um, they're not particularly rich anymore or, or important, but there still are de Hauteville's um, in Normandy. Um, so five minutes to go over the final map. So, in general, the Holy Roman Emperor got the best of the whole thing with coming down into Italy and eating it one chunk at a time. And the holdings of the Pope were reduced and pushed back around Rome um, and that area mostly because of the Normans. Um, the Norman holdings uh, through either the Drengot family or the de Hautefield family came all the way up to include Benevento, except for the town which they held for the Pope. Um, Capua was a, a, another Norman, uh, a Norman and Lombard intermarriage. Uh, Duke Amalfi was 
slowly, shortly after my end date of 1101, which is the death of Roger I, Naples was absorbed into Capua. It was a holdout, uh, independent holdout, but it got absorbed into Norman conquest. So basically, you have all of the northern and central part of Italy, except a small um, area around Rome that um, was the Holy Roman Emperor, and everything to the south um, is controlled by one Norman or the other. Um, the vast majority is held by Robert or Roger, or both of them together. Um, so, you have three minutes for questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's a lot. Anybody have questions? One of the things that Roger did to establish the multicultural facet of his kingdom was to have all his official pronouncements in Greek, in Norman French, and in um, Arabic uh, language. Also, if I've got three minutes and no one's asking questions, I'm going to tell you about why Palermo is hard to capture. I've actually been to Palermo. It is a it, it's on the, you know, it's shaped kind of like this. So it's an upside down triangle. And Palermo is on the Western portion of the top. Um, and it is a little range of mountains in a horseshoe with the port in between the narrowest part of the horseshoe. So it is almost impossible to take by land because of the advantage of the mountains behind it. And they took a lesson from the Byzantines and made a giant chain. And there were, there still are two little castles on each side of that horseshoe where they had these massive water-driven engines to lift the chain. So if they were attacked by sea, they merely lifted the chain and the boats would, the ships would tear themselves apart when they hit the chain, the chain, or they would just stop and they could pick them off with archers and with fire at that point. So the way that Robert and Roger took Palermo was to do both. They actually got into the port, a few ships into the port, but they were also stuck. And so they just d d um, got all, took the horses and men, that were, on the ship off onto land. Meanwhile, um, Roger on land and cavalry came in from the other side at the same time. And of course, siege, starvation, um, and treachery, uh, getting people to help them from the inside. So that's how they took Palermo. And I think I'm done. Thank you. I know you were digesting a whole lot of information. No, I, 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 it, I'm sure it's overwhelming, and I hope to teach this class with the Roger one um, this summer. I think there's a couple of opportunities, and then I want to teach it in, them both in person um, at a local event. So um, I can use all the practice I can get, um, and anything that you think that I could do to make the next ones better, I'd be glad to hear it. It, it is, imagine trying to boil down the 20th century, you know, starting with someone killing an archduke and go all the way through nuclear bombs and computer revolution and all that. So it's 45 a long, minutes, yeah. <laughs> 45 minutes, yeah. So, um, but. Well, and then Roger, because the other Normans were so jealous of him. <laughs> Well, I think we don't know. There were a lot of historians for Robert. We know a lot about Robert, things that he's quotations of what he said, and his personality comes really clear. Roger is not all that clear. 
um, because he did not have a historian following him around. Um, but I don't know that he chose by personality to be kind or inclusive or whether it was just that Norman practicality, it was the only way that he could succeed. Um, but also the, the Islamic administration of the ports and the trade was one of the best in the world at the time. Um, accountants went from there to other parts of the world and made money for them by their method, um, which was probably Egyptian originally, Cairo uh, originally. And it was good sense to let them continue to manage the trade. Of course, then he got accused of being a secret Muslim. Well, yeah, that's, an, that's, a, that's yeah, well, Roger did because he wouldn't let the Pope proselytize to his Saracen troops. And then Robert really had problems with it. Robert was almost, um, you know, they were getting close to heresy charges on Roger II. Wow. So my next class, previews of the next class. Excellent, excellent. And with that, I'm going to stop the recording.